Greetings all. You will recall that I had promised in the last Q&A that I would do a special episode on the T26E4, commonly known as the Super Pershing. I have to admit, it does kind of look cool, especially the ETO variant with the additional armor. So what happened to it? Why did it not work out? I am here to answer this question for you. The basic idea, obviously, was to make a better hole puncher. The heavy tank T26E3 had been finally made to fix all, or at least most, of the flaws of the previous variant, the E1. And though Barnes did look upon his work and he saw that it was good, it was also noticed that really the 90mm gun M3 was closer in performance to the short 8.8 .8 found on Tiger 1 and not as good as the long 8.8 .8 found on Jagdpanther or Tiger 2 the U.S. was apparently still behind the gun power curve. Fortunately, the U.S. had such a gun in development, the 90mm T-15. It didn't seem such a huge step to see about mounting it into a T-26. So they did. Aberdeen, of course, happened to have a Pershing hanging around, a T-26E1, which they had used for trials. They didn't have a full-on T-15 to install, so a T-15E1, which is just a tad smaller, uh, that was installed instead. They then rejiggered the internal stowage a little bit to handle the 50 odd inch long rounds. Rejiggered is a technical term. In order to balance the gun and get it to elevate, large equilibrator springs had to be installed on the turret front and a counterweight on the back of the turret. There are two initial observations which result from this vehicle. The first is that this was T26E1 rejected by armored forces being unfit for combat. After all, there's a reason that they moved to T26E3, and with the exception of stowage, the gun was not the reason why. The second is that it very quickly became apparent to the testers that the single-piece ammunition simply did not work in the confined space of a tank turret, to the point that the gun could not be at a high elevation to load. They immediately requested that any further T15s be redesigned to accommodate two-piece ammunition. Mechanically, the gun worked, at, at least on the test range. Of course, after realizing that the tank's gun and ammunition didn't really work well in the tank, and that it was a variant of T26 which was not approved for combat, there was only one thing for them to do with this tank. They sent it to Europe to fight. This is one of the few examples of ordnance being permitted to send over a particularly questionable piece of equipment. I have mentioned before how Barnes was so confident in his creations that field trials would immediately show the incredible awesomeness and genius of his designs and vindicate them. At least T26E3, although it hadn't yet been approved by Armored Force and thus AGF, Army Ground Forces, that tank was built to correct the errors in T26E1. What I have not seen is whether any of the corrective works to, for example, the powertrain were applied to the Super Pershing that went overseas. Uh, officially, it was temporary pilot T26 E4 number one. Or did it go overseas as it was? It is to be noted, for example, that it kept the original loader's hatch, although granted that would be a rather hard and relatively unimportant thing to fix. In any case, the tank found its way to Europe. The ammunition found its way to a different part of Europe. The error was discovered when a TD unit with 90mm guns telephoned, asking why their ammunition supply that they had just received didn't fit their guns. Anyway, this is one of those reasons why I recommend that folks keep a copy of Belton Cooper's book on their bookshelves. Whatever his opinions about things that he had absolutely no idea about, unless he was a barefaced liar, he was the chap in charge of putting the extra armor onto the tank. Two one and a half inch sheets of boilerplate on the front hull, well, two on top, two on bottom, totaling about five tons, and a piece of Panther tank armor on mantlet. This, of course, put the gun completely out of balance, so armored plate wings were added to put on a bit of weight behind the trunnions and allow the gunner to actually elevate the gun. Now, Honeycutt's book states that the wings were for extra protection, but Cooper's correct statement of the issues of balance, combined with his description of how they figured out just how much weight to add and where, does lean in favor of the balance position and not extra armor, even though it would have had that effect. Since they had just added a whole bunch of weight to the front of the turret, they now needed to add a whole bunch of weight to the back of the turret. In the end, they added an extra seven or so tons onto a vehicle which was already several tons heavier than a standard Pershing, 
which would itself prove to be of questionable power capability in Korea. In the E3 variant, which was an improvement over the E1 variant, this one, which all the extra weight and the big gun was being applied to. How the tank managed to make it as far as Dessau and then back to Castle is unexplained. Something else mentioned by Cooper was the size of the ammunition. They started out by using two people to load around, but eventually figured out a way for a single man to do it, albeit with difficulty. It is also interesting to note that as far as Cooper knew, the only time the Super Pershing ever killed anything was an unidentified tank at about 1500 yards at Northheim, near Dessau. Yet it is claimed that at Dessau it killed a King Tiger, but not by Cooper. That the Super Pershing made it to Dessau and killed something is not improbable. It's not as if Cooper would have been receiving all the situation reports about you know, his baby. But there is no evidence of any King Tigers anywhere near the place at the time, so we'll just leave it as another tank, maybe a Panzer IV. So we're pretty sure that Super Pershing managed to kill two tanks, which in fairness is probably better than most of the US tanks of the war, many of which may never have seen two tanks to kill in the first place. However, let us return to the US and see what was going on next. Temporary pilot number two shows up, and this time it was based off a of T-26E3, so it's at least mechanically a service-grade tank. The gun is now the T-15E2 with two-piece ammunition, which is good, but the big spring equilibrators are still on the outside of the turret. Still, it's an improvement good enough that someone had decided to place an order in March of 1945 that a thousand of these tanks would be acquired. Fortunately, it was to be a diversion of an extant order of T-26s, not an entirely separate contract. The end of the war meant that they no longer needed a thousand of these things right now, so production was scaled back to 25 pending testing to see if they were worthwhile for future runs. As before, the tanks passed ordnance testing, they mechanically worked. Then off to Fort Knox went one to see what the end user thought. Possibly the biggest difference between the pilots and the production systems was that there was no longer a big equilibrator spring on the outside of the turret. Instead, they found room for a hydropneumatic system in the front left of the turret interior to help redress the guns being 11,000 foot-pounds out of balance. In theory, it was possible to adjust this equilibrator to make the gun balanced, but it seems that Fort Knox just couldn't manage it for whatever reason. Even with reduced gearing, they found that elevating the gun with the hand wheel just took too much effort. And this was after reducing the gearing by about a third from the standard M26, which Armored Force thought already was a little bit slow for getting onto a target. Max elevation was found to be just over 18 degrees, a little shy of the intended of 20. Depression remained at the standard 10 though. Traverse wasn't any better. Even with a ton and a quarter of dead weight attached to the turret rear, the turret balance was off and rotating when on a slope was difficult. However, in fairness, the power traverse did seem generally up to the task, although not quite as responsive as on a standard Pershing. Part of this again is due to a changed gearing ratio. It took 23 seconds to do a full 360 on T26E4. You could expect 18 seconds from a standard Pershing. The gun alone added an extra half ton to the front, sticking way out there. At the end of it all, combat stowed, the tank came in at two and a half tons more than a standard Pershing. The tank required about twice as many man hours of maintenance per mile as the standard T26E3, though if it did get the maintenance, it was about as reliable as a standard tank, i.e. it was more, just as likely to show up for the fight as it would have been uh, on a standard tank. Then again, a fair bit of the maintenance was due to the turret traverse gear, which kept breaking due to the stresses imparted by the heavy, out-of-balance turret. Ammunition stowage was a fundamental problem. Even split into a separate projectile and charge case, and these cases were really, really large. A standard H-wrap round for a Pershing's M3 90mm weighed in at 36 pounds and was 36 inches long. A HE round was 42 pounds and 37 and a half inches long. The cartridge case alone for the T15E2 gun was 36 and a half inches long and 27 pounds for high explosive and 39 and a half inches long and 27 pounds for HVAP. Add on to that an additional 16 inches and 23 pounds for the HE projectile or 13 inches and 16 and three quarter pounds for the HVAP projectile and you start to see some significant stowage problems. 
Being relatively short, finding stowage for the projectiles wasn't too much of a bother. 24 projectiles would be stowed in a ready rack on the left turret wall, and 5 in a ready rack in the bustle. The remaining 25 of the 54 were scattered around the hull, mainly on the right side. The problem was the casings. Six were in the left sponson, three of them were above floor level, the other three were below. The remaining 48 were under the turret floor in bins. As the report stated, in no sense can it be said that there are any ready propelling charges. And in the army speak of the time, the ammunition, quote, was not conducive to accomplishing high rates of fire, unquote. Only a few locations would the HVAP charge fit into. And to make matters worse, depending on where the turret was positioned, anything from the gunner's footrest to the equilibrator drain plug would prevent the bins from opening, as I said, depending on where the turret is traversed in relation to the hull. Perhaps some of those issues could be rectified over time. Caliber 50 and caliber 30 stowage also had to be reduced a little bit as well. Not too much, maybe 10%. In any case, the reality was that the loader would hunt around for the charge first, which likely required getting off his seat. Then he would sit down with this huge charge on his lap and then grab the projectile. When ready, load in sequence, and then hope that the gun isn't at too high of an elevation. Worse, if firing HVAP, like in the shorter M3 gun, the lack of recoil from the light projectile meant that the breech block needed to be manually opened. And then, once you've done that, you've got this really, really large shell casing flying around the inside of the turret to deal with. Being an extra 20 calibers long, the gun added 71 inches to the vehicle. This led to more problems. Now, ordinarily, the issues of crossing obstacles with a prominent gun are dealt with either by elevating the gun or by spinning the turret off to one side, if possible. In common with its M3 armed prototype, E4 did not have power elevation. Care needed to be taken to avoid digging the muzzle into the dirt. This was something of a new problem for armored force testers, which until then had generally only had to deal with shorter or higher mounted cannons. The report stated, it throws new light onto the importance of power elevation. So what did you actually get for all of this trouble? About next to 400 feet per second. At 1,000 yards against armor sloped at 30 degrees, that gave you an extra 1.4 inches with an AP round up to 6.2 inches, and the same 1.4 inch improvement with HVAP to a total of 9.2 inches. That said, with a muzzle velocity of 3750 feet per second for HVAP, range and lead estimation errors are something less of a problem, and the gun wasn't considered really any less accurate than the standard 90 millimeter. The ammunition was another matter, the dispersion was worse on the range, but it was attributed to poor quality control, which also damaged the muzzle brake and barrel a little bit. In the end, it was concluded that traverse and elevation were too slow, ammunition loading was too slow and tiring, the turret parts kept breaking too much, and mobility was reduced. The recommendation was short and to the point. No further consideration be given the heavy tank T26E4 with the 90mm gun T15E2. Of course, now the army is saddled with about 25 functioning tanks, designated development standard, which, excepting the gun, are more or less equal to the tanks currently in service. As they would never be put into an operational unit, not with their unique ammunition supply requirements and damning test report and their utility, a suitable testing program was found for them. They became hard targets to determine the resistance of Pershings to anything from armor-piercing rounds through rockets to firebombs. It actually came out quite well from the firebomb tests. This, of course, depleted their numbers. To my knowledge, only one Super Pershing remains. It's in Contigny, Illinois, about an hour west of Chicago, sitting on open display at the First Division Museum. Perhaps one day, someone will rescue it. Right, that is it for Super Pershing. Now, there is one interesting caveat, and that is the T-32 heavy tank. This also came with the T-15 gun with the two-part ammunition, i.e. T-15E2. The test report for that I've mentioned before, and it came out very well. There's no particular complaints about ammunition handling being identified. Now, perhaps this was because as a heavy tank, rate of fire wasn't considered the highest priority, or perhaps it was because although superficially the thing looks like a Pershing turret, it might actually be just a little bit bigger. 
I would have to look it up. I haven't gone after the scale drawings with a ruler yet. So if somebody else has, please feel free to comment below and save me the bother. Uh, I may get back to this in the next Q&A and respond with my findings. Right, hope you found this interesting and informative, and I will see you on the next one.